Hello and welcome to the Genius Move Audio Academy podcast. My name is Paul Brewer. In this podcast, I'll chat to people who were professionally involved in the music business, both here in Ireland and abroad. If you're listening to this, perhaps you have an interest in learning. Please visit geniusmove.ie, check my courses or book a one-to-one teaching session. Today's guest is library music and games composer Vince Webb. Vince made an interesting video on YouTube entitled Creating a Library Music Album from Start to Finish. I enjoyed the video a lot, so I decided to contact Vince to see would he be up for a podcast, specifically about the process mentioned in the vid. Vince was the first stranger I'd actually interviewed, someone who I hadn't crossed paths with before. As usual, I started by asking him how he got involved in music. His website is vinceweb.com. Yeah, so definitely started life as a as a improviser and as a pianist. Just I mean, I'm so, when I say started i'm talking like from like five years old or whatever just kind of my my first kind of intro to music and to i guess kind of a form of composition is definitely just lots of improvising at the piano and that kind of gradually evolved into something more like composing but i I was raised in quite a creative household both both my parents were visual artists um and so they're very encouraging of the music thing and also of the concept of doing a musical career, they weren't at all unnerved by that. In terms of like getting into the industry itself, I mean, I did a music degree and stuff. I was doing bits of freelance composition work while I was still an undergraduate in London. And those kind of early opportunities were mostly in the form of little pieces for indie games, like mobile phone games for the most part, because there was a lot of uh, app development going on around that time for like the iPhone and Android sort of app stores that were gaining in popularity just for those little sort of Candy Crush-esque kind of games or little pick-up-and-play things, puzzles and things. And then I was earning a bit of pocket money from that, which was my first indication that, oh, maybe I could actually do a sort of musical, do a composing thing for a job. What age were you at this time? Uh, just as a university student, so sort of 18, 19. Right, okay. And you're from London, is that correct? Uh, I was born in London, yeah. I actually grew up on the south coast in Portsmouth. And yeah, I went to school there and then I moved to London for my undergraduate degree in music at King's College London. And it was cool, actually, because they have quite a few, obviously, there have a few different music schools in London. King's, being part of University of London, has links with uh, Royal Academy of Music and SOAS and you know a couple of other places. So I was able to get my piano lessons at the Royal Academy and take some modules at SOAS. And I even did a study abroad over in the States as well uh, at University of North Carolina. W- um, what's SOAS? Or? SOAS is a School of Oriental and African Studies. I did a, quite an academic degree. So it was a lot of thinking about, talking about music, a little bit of practical stuff. Um, but it was kind of designed to be quite a broad focus degree um, rather than like a conservatoire or anything like that. And... Have you no rock and roll background in you? You know, sort of uh, favorite records <laughs> bands and stuff, and stuff like, like that, and bands and stuff. Yeah, most of like the the playing I was doing um, and the performing I was doing was more, I guess, more sort of like jazz oriented, or as part of ensembles or kind of like orchestras and things like that, sort of productions. I d- had a brief period of of being part of a little kind of new folk band called Kinsley and the Kilowatts which makes me a sort of former kilowatt, I guess. <laughs> um, we actually did a mini a tour in Cork, funnily enough. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah, I, I just played uh, melodica and uh, I think bits of percussion and stuff. Um, but yeah, sadly no longer active. Um, but yeah, I, did, I mean, when I was growing up, I did a lot of jamming and stuff. I, I was quite involved in my local church um, music scene, so and that was very much a kind of jamming out music from chord sheets kind of thing, as opposed to the sort of reading off of a, like everything written out on a score. So that was quite a nice like complement to the sort of things that I was doing in a school context. Right. It's helped to kind of broaden out my um, experience playing music. But quite, yeah, just lots of varied musical activities, I would say, like as I was growing up, which was really, I think all of that obviously feeds into just developing a bit of an ear and and a kind of a taste for different styles and things like that. And library music, as you know, is kind of, I, th- I think the majority of library music writers, I might be wrong, but I feel like it's quite normal to do a range of styles and genres as a library composer. And so I felt kind of quite 
um, suited naturally to do that when the opportunities came up a bit further down the line. Um, you spoke about app development, stuff like that. Like, mm. was that just a sort of, a, you know, a blip in, in the, the cycle mm. and that you happened to jump onto the cycle around that time? Was that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's always, because whenever people ask me, like, how to get into the industry and stuff, I always feel like it's, it's a bit of a hard one to answer because very often it's just a case of like what sort of random opportunities are kind of presenting themselves to you kind of and then like how do you respond to those is the part that you have control over I guess and the sort of the random opportunities that came my way as I say earlier on were um, just because it happened to coincide with this yeah a bit of a boom in indie development um, I managed to find some work via just like clicking around on online forums and posting my portfolio and saying, you know, you know, I'm starting out, I'm looking to get experience working on projects, you know, let me know if you need sound effects or music for these sorts of projects. And and then I got a lot of referrals through that. And yeah, I mean, I, I sort of got a decent amount of work through that, mostly just, you know, a couple of hundred quid here, a couple of hundred quid there. And most of these companies, they released one game and then they sort of folded, they couldn't make it as a business, like 99% of those Companies don't exist now. Um, so they would have been young people as well. Yeah, a lot of just like bedroom startup types and people kind of just just trying it out. Um, and one of those companies actually called CoatSync is um, they actually managed to push through and make it. And so they're now one of my regular game music clients. I work with them, so they've actually I don't know how many on employees they have now. Probably about two hundred employees, and wow. they're based in uh, <laughs> Gateshead. They do a lot of VR projects. So besides library music, I would say my other kind of career focus has been game audio and specifically um, working on VR projects just because, again, not I didn't necessarily seek that out, but of all the companies I worked with, um, that was the one that, did, that happened to be successful and they happened to have a good relationship with uh, Facebook, now Meta. Um, and so they got entrusted with quite a few large-ish projects for their various uh, devices. Which is nice, yeah. So I mean, then that kind of tip tip me into the whole sort of spatial audio, interactive audio world, which is yeah, again, like absolutely fascinating, and not necessarily something that I sort of sought out from the get go. That's interesting about the VR and stuff like that. Does that like Dolby Atmos? Does that play and does that have an impact on your work these days? Um, so yeah, so funnily enough, the studio that I'm currently working out of does have a Dolby Atmos set up upstairs in their like main control room. I've yeah played around with it a tiny bit. Most of what I do in VR is sort of virtual surround, I guess. And in the past, whenever I've made spatial mixes, it's more been in the ambisonics format. I suppose there's no reason it couldn't have been done as a kind of virtual Dolby setup. I mean, before ambisonics was more more of a thing. I remember some early VR projects, we sort of essentially we had a kind of virtual speaker array that we were experimenting with from which, you know, we'd sort of like break the music into stems and then just have like mono point sources. And it was just a way of getting some like gentle directionality. The context for this was there was a game that I worked on that had rather than most VR games at the time, which were first person, this particular one was like a kind of diorama that would appear in front of the player. It was kind of, kind of a top-down, little, almost like a little model city kind of thing. And you could control the characters walking around. It was like a turn-based combat strategy game um, in set in this like amazing cyberpunk world. And I loved it. I loved the uh, art style and everything. It was really cool. But yeah, we were sort of playing around with getting a bit of, of a front-facing feel from a lot of the music and the sound effects. And so we were sort of playing around with having these like virtual speakers inside the game engine. So in terms of what I was doing, the only real impact it had was just more imaginatively, like and anticipating the slight difference in feel that that would have and then bouncing out stems accordingly. There are other games where the spatial audio component can have a bit more of a, a featured role. I've done sort of things in, in VR projects before where we sort of intentionally will spatially mix the music so that you know, it feels kind of more embedded into the world in a way that makes sense. But a lot of the time, it's not really desirable, sometimes not even particularly noticeable. Um, so it's, it's, it's all very, it's all very project specific, these kinds of things. So um, 
So I guess in answer to the question, it's like, uh, just because I'm working in VR, it doesn't necessarily mean that I think about spatial audio at all. Actually, quite often I'll just be delivering stereo down mixes. But there is that opportunity to uh, to kind of play a bit with the spatial element. I haven't really been requested so far um, spatial mixes for a library. I mean, it's been talked about. I don't know. I mean, my biggest impression is that like the consumer experience side hasn't quite caught up to it or maybe it's like there hasn't been enough new and original albums intentionally mixed that way and consumed that way for people to kind of really understand or be that engaged with the sort of potential of that as a format i mean like i feel like there are people who don't even realize that like the whatever's being piped through there airpod pros or whatever is like is being automatically like it switches to a spatial mix and a lot of people aren't even particularly aware of that or don't really care or for me i'm not particularly in that world of pop music specifically but i have have some contact with people who are and it all feels a little bit foggy compared with using spatial audio cues in a vr game context which is kind of the only direct experience that i've had of, of spatial mixing and stuff so it's relating the sound to the uh, game action. Yeah, exactly. It feels like you can be a lot more purposeful when you're playing around with spatial audio cues in a VR game like narrative context because that you can then start to blur the line intentionally between music and sound design. You can, you know, make the music kind of feel just a bit differently on your headphones. You know, if suddenly um, there are elements of the music that are seem to be like staying put in the spatial field right. um, and rather than just like being headlocked, as they say, um, that can just create a, d- a slightly different sensation that is, you know, again, it, it's still subtle, but that feels like because in VR, you're uh, inherently moving around a lot more, you're kind of going to have a bit more of an opportunity to experience those spatial cues as well. My interest has generally been um, more, on, more on that end of things, I guess, the sort of soundtrack end of things. So far, I haven't had any particular pop music spatial audio mix experiences as a listener that have totally made me think this is like definitely the future they've got me that excuse yeah they've got me super excited um but who knows who knows i mean yeah like definitely composers have been playing around with spatial concepts in music especially in like live performance you know for centuries i think about like you know, so antiphonal brass, where they have sort of like the brass sections up in the galleries of like a cathedral, for example, and create special effects and, you know, offstage brass in big orchestral pieces. And, you know, yeah, often in religious contexts, there's sort of choirs being at the back. I remember when I used to be a chorister, like way back when I was little, and um, we did certain things where we'd stand at the back of the cathedral for effect and things like that. I feel like we definitely respond as humans to that the emotionality of space and the potential there um yeah absolutely the idea of two channels that was a, a restriction of the technology really wasn't it R- you know rather hmm. than any, any particular reason for it i suppose so i mean certainly in, especially when you start to involve any kind of listener movement i guess if you're sat still i mean you have two ears if you have like I have a perfectly satisfying experience listening to a set of monitors, for example, if they're well positioned and they're nice sound coming out. There's no, nothing else, nothing really happens when you orient yourself. It can sort of potentially not break the immersion. I mean, it's like, but it, it sort of depends on your the expectations that you're bringing to it, I guess. But there is that potential to, for it to kind of reveal even more if you sort of incline your head or turn around or even move backwards or forwards, you know. Yeah. Re- relating to the library music thing, I ha- yeah, as I say, I haven't, I haven't actually sort of either worked on or, or been requested any spatial audio mixes so far. But I mean, I, I have had conversations with library owners about the possibility of it. I think there's some interest, but it's always considered as like, oh, maybe it'd be a nice thing to have in addition to our regular stereo mixes, which are going to be the kind of the main thing that we offer to our clients. But, you know, if, if VR production becomes more prevalent, i.e. If, if people are consuming spatial media a bit more, like 360 film, I think having underscores and beds and library tracks that are mixed in more than two channels, I think, could start to be really beneficial. Again, that feels like the biggest 
benefit for me is in like a VR context. It's the most obvious use case as opposed to like spatial for like flat screen media as like, like a posh version of surround or something like a posh version of stereo, if that makes sense. But have you, because I'm really interested in um, a lot of the kind of more emergent forms of um, entertainment, like like the sort of 360 video and inter- interactive storytelling and all that kind of things, which I've been aware of for a while just because I've happened to be working on VR projects and stuff. And a lot of these things kind of get floated around. We've moved on from your app days. How did you get involved in library music as such? Or was it a natural extension of where you were going? It was a couple of things. Probably the one thing that made me most aware of library music as a potentially interesting direction to go was the fact that I did a stint working in a studio. Actually, this studio, funnily enough. Um, Another part of it. That's the church, isn't it? Yeah, so Bleach Productions, who are an audio production company, are based here. The studio owner, Ricky, was one of the people that I reached out to immediately after graduating from university. Um, And it just happened to be good timing that he was looking for somebody just to assist in the studio and um, basically do a bit of dog's body work and make tea and stuff. So I did that for, I'm not sure exactly how, maybe like two years or so. And he was also running a small MCPS library, which I was involved with. And just uh, MCPS? The kind of counterpart to PRS, they handle the mechanical royalties. I mean, MCPS, PRS are kind of basically the same organization. Um, but an MCPS music library specifically, it generally just refers to the fact that they have quite a standardized deal for the way that the publisher and the composer relate, basically a 50-50 split. So it's this like quite traditional way of administering library music that fundamentally hasn't changed that much since the 1950s. That's probably quite a good thing for anybody like considering getting into the industry is, yeah, I, I would personally say it's it might be a good idea to focus the search on MCPS libraries just because there's a certain like tried and tested way of working and I guess probably from a composer point of view, there's slightly more of a a reassurance that you're going to maybe do a bit well off of those, a bit more well off those libraries compared to other parts of the industry can be a bit more of a wild west, if you know what I mean, in terms of how they charge their clients, how the composers get paid. And, you know, if you don't, there's, there's almost an overwhelming number of ways that you can do business. And like just going for like MCPS libraries, like a lot of the big, big names in library music are MCPS yeah, it's quite a good way to kind of filter out all of the different libraries and just figure out which ones to choose from. Maybe initially is to focus on and those. And perhaps you'd, as a, as a musician, you wouldn't even have to know the ins and outs of the details because the MCPS will sort of protect both sides equally. Yeah, I think that's part of, of why it's there, for sure. It's just kind of... And are there many libraries in London? Like, are there 100? Are there 200? Are there 1,000? Yeah, there are a ton. I mean, there's, off the top of my head, I mean, there's probably, like, maybe... Uh, there's probably over a hundred. Like, there's a lot of of larger ones. Maybe there's maybe twenty or so like large independents in London at least. Um, what's cool is you can go onto the the PRS website and there's a big list of MCPS libraries. And yeah, I would say the majority of the UK ones have offices in London. Most of the larger ones will also be sub published around the world as well. So. As a composer, if you're getting your music into one of these libraries, you know, you're not only having your music represented in London, but also in Tokyo and LA. And, you know, it's another one of my kind of big tips for composers get, getting into library music is to focus your search on library companies that have a lot of global sub publishing as well, because it's kind of a no brainer. Ultimately, you're getting your track into like 10 libraries rather than one, you know, so has a much better chance of getting used. London is definitely the place in the UK. I mean, like a lot of industries, it's it's kind of where all the library companies are and there's, you know, various opportunities, you know, events or Christmas parties or things that happen here. You know, there's the Production <laughs> Music Awards that happens here that was a, uh, a couple of weeks ago. So yeah, it's definitely a hot spot. Yeah, so I, I learned about the library music industry through Bleach, an audio production company, and also have this this library. Um, just a little small independent based out of this studio. And that gave me, yeah, a bit of insight into how the industry works and also, you know, things like sub-publishing and um, and different business models that, that existed. Around that time, Audio Network was quite new on the scene and they were offering something that was quite uh, quite a different style of, of way of working with uh, clients that were basically offering uh, quite cheap 
blanket licenses and sort of a more of a all you can eat kind of approach. And so I my my sort of um, perspective on companies like that was coming from being sort of familiarized first with this more traditional way of working and then seeing, recognizing that more innovative companies like Audio Network, in some sense in conflict with that, or they were sort of competing business models. And so I sort of, I guess from that, it just got a little bit of a feel because I suppose the difficult thing is without a little bit of sort of context as a composer, it's sort of all the libraries sort of look the same. And did you do anything like that in college as part of college, like the teaching the the uh, the business end of it? No, not really. Not in my particular course. Um, I chose to do a course that was, yeah, as I say, fairly academic in nature and quite traditional in terms of theory and um, musicology and harmony and things like that. So all of the sort of business side of it was very much just picked up on my own as I was going along, kind of making it up as I went along. Making mistakes. Yes. And same with the audio <laughs> production side. Oh, yeah, I haven't studied that at all formally. Um, it's very much a case of learning on the job. Yeah, I, I did a lot of hustling initially in the first sort of couple of years after leaving uni to get in with a few different libraries. And it wasn't as hard as I expected. I think the library music industry is a little bit easier to get in at ground level compared with maybe trying to get into scoring like TV or documentaries or something. There is an element of you don't necessarily have to be established beforehand. If your stuff sounds good and it sounds usable, there's no reason that a company won't want to work with you if you're, you know, a nice person or whatever, um, like keep the deadlines. Yeah, I, I did a lot of just sending out random demos and trying to, yeah, trying to just get a foot in the door, cold calling and all that sort of stuff that you do. And yeah, and then when I found a couple of libraries that were happy to work with me, it was just, I guess I ended up just working with quite a small number of clients and on a sort of repeat basis rather than sort of spreading myself too thinly um, and sort of building those relationships over time. What was beautiful about that kind of work is that it slotted in very nicely around other slightly more frantic jobs that would come in, which were shorter turnaround. You know, library music's fantastic in that way for just filling out the schedule a bit in between jobs and just being stuff, being something that you can constantly just be working on right. in the background. It's very helpful. Yeah, because you, you mentioned the initial bit of time decided for after the mixing, you, you decided to add that in with the client and they could do that. You know, there's no particular deadline needed to be, you know, in stone for you. Yeah. Are you sorry? Are you referring to the the album on the video? Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's definitely flexibility. And also, yeah, I mean, I guess the thing to to note is that library companies differ quite a lot in the extent that they are willing to either pay for or take care of things like mixing or um, live recording and things like that. In general, there's definitely a good amount of flexibility with schedules and and a good amount of flexibility with when it, when it comes to just planning out or envisioning a project. I would say if like my experience has been, if I've got a strong idea and a particular way that I want to work and I can kind of flesh it out and it merges well with what the library is trying to achieve and if they think it'll be kind of valuable then there's no reason we can't make that happen i think in the past i was just like saying yes to everything and just happy that anybody would give me any work and kind of just eager to please that was great in a different way because then i ended up working on all sorts of stuff and and in the process figuring out what i enjoyed and what i was better or worse at but now yeah now now library music actually represents something slightly different which is a slight opportunity to kind of think about what rabbit hole I want to go down and explore and while at the same time thinking about what's going to be useful for the client and basically finding like what yeah what am I going to be really excited to produce and then sort of sharing that excitement with the with the client and to, I guess tailoring it a bit to my strengths whereas earlier on it was much more about just hitting a brief if that makes sense yes like you mentioned that you're 10 years with the particular company isn't it yeah roughly yeah and is that that's the same people involved is it there's yeah there's one chap who's been there since I started working there sort of um in a different role now he's kind of running the running the show, whereas previously he was more of an account executive, I think. Right. Th that personal relationship is a, is a big selling point as well, isn't it? Yeah, big time. It takes a while to develop that relationship of trust, and especially when there's larger 
production fees involved. There's definitely like a core team of writers who are kind of leaned on for those sort of like flagship albums and, and opportunities. But at the same time, you know, genuinely, there is that openness to, to new people as well coming on, I think. In some sense, my job hasn't really changed that much, you know, and all like the, the amount of exposure opportunity from library music hasn't really changed that much. It's just that I've done more of it. Um, so it's more financially beneficial because of the kind of cumulative effect of how many tracks are out there. But fundamentally, it's, you know, I'm not being given that much different responsibilities now as a more sort of senior, in inverted commas, library writer. It's all pretty much the same. But mm. at the same time, that album we're talking about was working with a string section and stuff like that. None of that would have happened if somebody in the office thought, Jay, we're not giving that to your man. No way, no way. <laughs> and the opposite happened insofar as, yeah, it'll be grand. We'll, we'll, we'll get it all thrown out. Like, can I ask how much did, mm. did that album cost? I think the string recording side of it, um, you know, doing 30 piece string section in London was like in the region of 10K kind of area. You know, and there was obviously other parts than those so like solo string recording and mixing costs and things like that. I, I would say that's that's kind of on the higher end. They sort of deliberately chose to go slightly more on the high end of, um, you know, choosing to mm. work in London rather than choosing to work in Eastern Europe, for example, which of a course, lot of libraries yes, do. Yes, indeed. Uh, choosing to work at a place like Angel, which is obviously part of the Abbey Road kind of group and the caliber of everyone there was really amazing. I think, you know, it's hard to say whether or not that's sort of, you know, a lot of that can kind of end up saving money as well because you're just working with people who can really zip through a lot of tracks in a short space of time and do it at a high level, yeah. Yeah, that definitely wasn't an everyday occurrence and part of that was a sort of celebration of uh, of the 500th album released by this this company, so... They want to do something a little bit special, but um, I, I do think, though, I do know of some of my peers who, who have done fewer library music projects or have have less of a track record, have had opportunities to work with string orchestras, just kind of like their first track or something. If the library likes the music, if they think that it'll be useful for their clients and their, you know, and, and often that will be an album that's shared among uh, several writers, you know, rather than just it all being on the shoulders of one composer, if they're a new composer. But yeah, as I say, I think it's just about matching people to the needs of the project kind of above and beyond everything else. But like you say, I think, yeah, it certainly helps to to build relationships over time. And I'm glad that I didn't sort of, you know, there are, there are bigger libraries out there than the ones that I happen to work with. And it would have been easy to sort of always kind of feel like the grass is greener and try and kind of get in there with this person, that person. But I mean, my my particular sort of temperament as well as I'm much more interested in just cracking on and writing music than I am in um, sort of... Selling it. <laughs> selling it and kind of, yeah, I guess I'm not um, super sort of business like focused or like um, money oriented. So that's kind of to my disadvantage in some ways, but it does mean that like if I get a good thing going with a client, I'm sort of more inclined to just like crack on and and enjoy the process and stuff rather than thinking too much about um, whether there are other better business opportunities out there, as long as I can make it work. And so the nice thing about that is then I end up working with the same people like, over a long period of time, which is, yeah, it's been a real nice thing to discover that. So how many companies do you work for then at the moment then? Like, is it the one or is it just or is it more than one? Or uh, Yeah, I mean, there's maybe uh, like two or three that I write for on a semi-regular basis. In the library world. What does semi-regular mean? How, how often is that? I mean, so in a typical year right now, I probably would do two or three albums or something. And so that might be mostly with one company. Yeah, it might be sort of one album for this company, one album for another company. But um, it's a little bit in flux right now because, like, for example, there's a company I used to work a, a lot with called Deep East Music who have, uh, in recent times, they've been bought up subsumed into bmg production music and they're under different management and now i have a bit more scope in a way to potentially work with somebody new because like one of my sort of regular companies is sort of no longer operating the same way anyway yeah so how many hours a day do you work then do you come in at nine and, and finish at six or how, how would that work? I do try and keep a roughly nine to five schedule a lot of the time. And then there are periods usually dictated by crunch time on more bespoke projects like video games. Games especially are very like 
compressed like towards the end of the production pipeline it's like then all the audio sort of gets done because it is dependent on a lot of the animations and a lot of the the game design and stuff so yeah for those kinds of periods it's sort of a you just put in the hours that you feel that you need to in order to get the job done it's yeah there's usually a couple of weeks basically where it's a bit frantic and you know the kinds of experience that you describe where you're sort of coming in early and going to bed late but um for the most part I would say I managed to keep to to office hours. Was that always the case? No, definitely not. <laughs> right. No, definitely not. I mean, I think I had a long period where I took full advantage of the sort of <laughs> liberal lifestyle of of being like a freelance <laughs> composer and basically yeah, just it was more sort of ad hoc laissez-faire attitude of just um kind of get up sort of whenever and quite often end up composing late into the night or into the early hours. Um, often because I was chasing some idea and just like genu genuinely sort of um, just vibing on a track and yeah, it would just be a bit sort of all over the place. And I would, I would usually also be just kind of a bit more spontaneous, I guess, when it came to making sure I had a social life and um, other other opportunities. You know, I wouldn't have any qualms about just, you know, in the middle of the day, just going off and meeting somebody for lunch and then kind of coming back at six o'clock in the evening and then picking up my, you know, booting up my computer again and sort of, um, you know, I think now I tend to be a little bit more like, uh, I sort of slowly come around to the, the value of having a bit more of a predictable schedule and kind of like scheduling in like social things a bit more rather than just being like, yeah, I can meet you in the middle of town in 20 minutes or whatever, <laughs> like, and leave in the studio. Um, I don't know. I slightly, I slightly miss the older way of doing things. And I think it's good to have a bit of both because I do have to remind myself, like, what's the point of being, you know, your own boss if you can't kind of be spontaneous? And, and especially when it comes to seeing people that, maybe themselves work slightly unsociable hours and so you want to catch people when they're available and stuff but um yeah i, I try not to um work too many weekends or work too late at night i am getting into a slightly more settled lifestyle i'm in the process of buying a flat for example at the moment and but yeah fundamentally yeah i don't have a lot of family responsibilities or like immediate family responsibilities right now and so yeah my my kind of work lifestyle reflects that for sure yeah, it would definitely change. It would have to change. But yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's interesting how it's just, it's been the case that the more I've been doing it, the more it's sort of just become apparent that there's certain benefits to to keeping some kind of office hours and not being at the mercy of, um, or sort of not feeling like I, I'm obliged to work sort of the extreme, yeah. the extreme hours. I mean, I, I think as well, there is a it scares me as well. <laughs> you know, there's a sort of an energy that that can take over people, especially when they're very interested in making it in um, in film or TV and those sort of really highly competitive environments that potentially have a big financial payoff. But, you know, at what cost? I, I mean, I certainly, it's not clear to me that I would do that well in that type of, uh, mm. that type of environment. I don't know. I would love to work in, in, in film and TV, but I guess you just have to kind of play it by ear. I'm sure it, it depends a lot on the directors and the producers that you're working with, how it tends to be. Do you know um, I'm, I know of him, yeah, yeah. I don't know him personally. All oh, right, okay. He was a, a guy up in Tyler when I was knocking around there, which was hmm. 10 years now at this stage. And I remember he was writing some music for some 12-episode program or whatever whatever it was mm, mm, mm. and he brought me in to show me this new bit of music what do you think of all that oh yeah it's very good very good yeah I made it out of all old bits does that happen often do you regurgitate stuff and mm. that's actually <laughs> a really cool question I like that like because it can like, I think that can potentially be a really creative and cool way to work I actually don't think I do but I know that one example is um, I work on a lot of pitches for TV advertising. So a classic thing that a lot of composers will do will be to then kind of turn those into library tracks and then give them to a library to get some secondary use out of them. And I've done that a tiny bit, but I've never really got on with that. I sort of always feel like it just doesn't excite me. And so I don't have that intrinsic motivation to kind of follow through on it. It's just such, it seems like such a inherently kind of yeah something just something kind of inherently boring about it to me so i it's kind of the same i don't work with a lot of templates i don't 
build up my own sample, like custom samples and things. Okay. Because I sort of feel like almost every time it it's more exciting to work from an empty project. And even if there's elements that I've recorded a hundred times before, like a snare hit or something with a with a brush, it's almost always better to just re-record that with a slightly different intention than it is for me to get my favorite like brush snare sample from my and when you say better what way do you mean better do you think i think it's just doesn't a snare brush kind of back in the mix and stuff and surrounded yeah. by a thousand yeah, well, things <laughs> you'd think so you'd think so i don't know it, it's i don't know whether it's much of a difference in terms of you know pure sonics but certainly from a the kind of perspective of working on a track and kind of trying to follow a thread through a production and make decisions. There's just something that sparkles a bit more about, you know, recording those simple elements and them just being ho like scoped in just that little bit more into your overall vision. So like even a snare hit, you know, which you think is kind of doesn't consist of much. It's just a transient, but there's something about like slightly different shades of intention that that kind of come before the snare hit that yeah there's, there's, there's just <laughs> some, something about it is more engaging <laughs> to me i mean it sounds it sounds kind of quite woo woo in a way but uh, a little. <laughs> i think it, it i think it makes it makes sense to me in the moment and maybe that's the right the point is that it's you know yeah, yeah, yeah. it wouldn't necessarily be apparent to somebody else from the outside but it kind of keeps me focused so that I'm staying true to the sounds that are in my head a bit more. I think the trouble a lot of the time with when you start bringing in pre-existing material as part of the writing process is that they kind of have, it feels like they have a bit of a, like an agenda of their own. They were, they were recorded in a particular way with a particular set of intentions. And it's like, there's some sense in which that kind of cloud of ideas feels like it slightly, it can kind of contaminate my my focus and my intentions a bit. So again, that's a, like a slightly weird way of describing it, but I basically, it's easy to get dragged off topic when using samples that pre-existing material or even sample libraries, you know, that have some a particular something, a particular character kind of baked into them, you know, even if it's subtle. Um, and of course you have the ability with processing to kind of tune those a bit more to, to what you want and uh, be more specific. But I think, um, for me, especially in the writing stage, like inten intentionality is is such a huge part of it. And if I'm not writing about something specific, then I'm not. Then it will just becomes kind of an unfocused mush, and it becomes difficult to to proceed or kind of you know I get lost or I just end up writing something that's a bit naff or or more commonly I just hit a bit of a brick wall. I think um, right, uh, yeah. So speaking of naff, what sort of percentage of the stuff you write, does it actually make the cut? Hmm. Well, hardly any. <laughs> really? But it doesn't matter. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, mean, I think, like, statistically, you know, it's probably, like, 5% or something. But you can only get 5%, like, you can only have, like, a handful of tracks get used each month if you've composed hundreds of tracks so that the chances of a few of them being used each month is, or each quarter is... Is that bit higher so yeah so on a given royalty statement on a given quarter it'll be a tiny percentage of tracks that are actually earning the majority of the income but in an ideal world those tracks are different every quarter and yeah i, I mean so that, that's kind of how it works when you look when i look at my royalty statements it's like loads and loads and loads of entries of like 0 0.001 pence and then you know maybe like 10 tracks or something that are maybe 80 percent of the uh the actual income from the the statement. So, and do you have any feeling when you're making them that it's oh yeah this is the one this is the, this is going to be it's going to be an earner. <laughs> <laughs> I used to, uh, yeah. I mean, my observation has been sadly <laughs> all of the time that I think that I've written an absolute banger. Or I'm really like personally excited. It almost never gets used. And the times where I've just kind of knocked off a track in five minutes and it's a bit generic it kind of ends up getting used over and over again. I think that's partly a reflection of, you know, the kinds of things that people reach for library music to achieve. Like, they're often, they're looking for something a little more vanilla and a little more... Um, library. Kind of, uh, yeah, <laughs> basically it's kind of, a, it, it's, yeah, library-ish, library music tends to do well. It's not much of a secret, you know. Um, 
Which is, yeah, it's it's an odd thing because I, in some ways I feel like the library music's a tiny bit conflicted because when I went to the Production Music Awards the other week, all of the tracks that were like winning the awards and being celebrated were the, the most unlibrary-ish library tracks ever. They were like these, basically sounded like pop tracks or, uh, you know, really like nicely produced kind of things with vocals and stuff. It's like 99%, at least for me, of like of the music that gets used is it's just the kind of bread and butter stuff that's kind of filling out, you know, reality TV and cooking shows and, you know, sports and stuff where it's like just some cheery bubbly beds or, you know, some nice kind of humorous pizzicatos or some, you know, some something. I mean, my, my favorite sync recently was uh, something got picked up for the BBC Sounds um, app, one of their podcasts. A track of mine was used as like a theme song for the giant tortoise, which... <laughs> made friends with a baby rhino in this like episode about these two animals. This is like a really sweet kind of 10 minute documentary. And every time they talked about the giant tortoise, my little kind of tortoisey, like pizzicato y track came in. And it was really nice. <laughs> and so I'm quite happy for, you know, it was, you know, it's classic library music, but I was quite happy about it. You know, it felt like it was at least finding its home. So like in that particular example, is it a case mm. of you've got a dancing tortoise or whatever, yeah. Did you write the bit of me, the music with you know? Oh yeah, this might be used in a dance and tour site or, or, or yeah. whatever. You know, it's like, it, was that a random? Yeah. Uh, it's kind. I mean, like, it, were you being all just, serious? And, and stuff? Uh, yeah. No, no. I mean, um, I think we were definitely going for some playful, some playful vibes. Um, that was a nice album we did. It was another reliable source music album. We recorded it all at Livingston Studios. Um, and it was all, pretty much all live. Um, small chamber strings. Had a real eight octave grand marimba, which was amazing. We had to we had to like assemble it inside the space because it was so massive. So it was kind of like disassemble it and assemble it. Um, and yeah, it was, I mean, my sensibility for a lot of the music that I write tends to be a little bit on the kind of light and quirky and playful side. So... It's not surprising. I get quite a lot of animal sinks. It's usually hedgehogs or uh, or giant tortoises or whatever. Which, yeah, again, I'm I'm quite happy. Those are the ones I always enjoy sending those ones to my mum as well. She really appreciates it. But uh, yeah, it's it's sweet. I, I really enjoy looking at the statement and kind of seeing where stuff has ended up. It's it's grounding, and it's a lot of stuff that I wouldn't necessarily watch myself. It's nice. I think like with that album, I didn't like you say I wasn't thinking, oh, this is going to end up in a sort of a true crime documentary I, you know you have a decent idea and um, there's a certain humility I think that goes with being into library music I, when I'm doing library I don't have aspirations necessarily for it to be like the most memorable thing that people hear it's more about just um, kind of being, being useful yeah. and uh, being high quality you know because you can still do it badly or you can do it well you know the fact that it was all live pizzicato for example I mean I absolutely love the sound of live like played as an ensemble and you just get all of that lovely like missed timing but not just random timing that you would like do in a DAW where you like select it and click humanize there's like the kind of missed timing that happens when players are genuinely trying to get it together <laughs> and it's like it's musically mis mistimed yeah I mean it's really I love that it's one of my favorite sounds so that's Vince's way of doing it Many thanks to Vince for taking the time to chat. Please visit www.geniusmove.ie to find out about audio courses to suit you. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.